Good evening, friends, and welcome. My name is Bill Harmer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Westport Library. It is my honor to welcome you to the fourth annual Story Fest and introduce Michael Lewis to Westport. Story Fest is a celebration of reading, writing, ideas, and community, and is the largest author event in the state of Connecticut. Last year, due to COVID, the event was held totally virtually. Nonetheless, we were grateful and honored to give all the authors who participated a platform on which to talk about their latest books. This year, we're fortunate to offer a hybrid version of the festival, with some authors joining us here at the library, while others remain virtual. The lineup is just as intriguing and exciting as years past, beginning with tonight's conversation between Lisa Belkin and best-selling author Michael Lewis. It'll be the perfect way to kick off StoryFest 2021. We hope you'll stick around for just a bit after our talk tonight to preview what else this week has in store for you. But now, on to tonight's program. Michael Lewis is a financial journalist and best-selling author on subjects ranging from politics to Wall Street. He's published 16 books, his latest being titled The Premonition, A Pandemic Story. The book follows three central characters as they confront the pandemic and find that the response from the White House is woefully inadequate. Mr. Lewis is an accomplished columnist for Bloomberg View and a contributing writer for Audiophile. His articles have also appeared in Vanity Fair, The New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, Gourmet, Slate, Sports Illustrated, Foreign Affairs, and Poetry Magazine. Joining Mr. Lewis in conversation this evening is Lisa Belkin. She is a journalist and author who has spent a career covering American social issues. The author of three books, she is best known for Show Me a Hero about a public housing battle in Yonkers, New York. In 2015, the book was made into an HBO miniseries of the same name, winning a Best Actor Award for its star, Oscar Isaac. Ms. Belkin has worked as a journalist for Yahoo News, the New York Times and Huffington Post. She hosted a radio show on XM, an outgrowth of her life's work column. She is also an adjunct faculty member at Columbia School of Journalism. Finally, I want to express my gratitude to Fermat Capital for their generous sponsorship of this program. So without further ado, I welcome both Michael and Lisa and very much look forward to the conversation tonight. Michael. Hello, Lisa. good to see hey, Lisa. you. It's, it's been a while. So we're here um, at a book festival to talk about a book, um, this one. I read it with, with two hats. One was a human being in America um, going through the pandemic and you were writing about it almost in real time, which we'll get to and how you pulled that off. And the other was as a writer and the idea of taking something that was, was going on in the moment, finding the characters you found, um, and, and taking a very complicated story with lots of science and lots of bureaucracy and making it into, you know, you've heard it before, almost like a novel. So start me, I guess, from the beginning of this book. What do you see it as being about? And why'd you write it? All right. Let's, so there is a back. There's a backstory to it, and it, it, the backstory is the previous book, The Fifth Risk, that I wrote, um, it, which was, which was all about looking at the federal government in a different way, um, as a manager of a portfolio of risks, many of them existential risks, and what happens when the people in charge of managing that portfolio don't really care about it. And what it triggered my interest was Donald, Donald Trump's election uh, that, and, his, mm -hmm. and his firing of his entire transition team before the transition happened. So, so there weren't people, I don't know, to go and listen to um, how the Obama administration had dealt with the Ebola outbreak or, or how they managed the nuclear arsenal or, or any number of other things that, you know, sort of are critical to the, 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 the stability of the society. Um, so I'd been kicking around with this idea, like, huh, you know, I'd, been, I'd written this story about like this basket of risks the government manages. I demonstrated to my satisfaction anyway, that um, we weren't paying really enough attention to this. And the question kind of was like, what's gonna happen? 
I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't think something was going to happen. So this happens. So all of a sudden there's a pathogen that loose in the land. And pretty quickly, it's clear that we have failed in our response to it. I mean, quite dramatically. I mean, that, that when I started to really engage middle of last year, well, it's kind of March of last year, but you know, there, there was a statistic bandied about that remained pretty stable until the vaccines appear on the scene. The United States has a bit more than 4% of the world's population and, and more than 20% of the world's deaths. And this, this so, so this, I mean, it's outrageous, right? This given, given that um, if you'd asked experts before the pandemic, what's going to happen in the world? How are different countries going to perform uh, if there is a pandemic? Uh, they would have told you that the United States would perform better than anybody because- Well, not if you ask experts there there were studies there was so there was basically the equivalent we of a, won yeah it was basically the equivalent of a preseason college football ranking that was done by the something called the nuclear threat initiative in washington and they spent millions of dollars uh in 2019 and drew on all the experts and you know hundreds of researchers trying to determine the the, the relative pandemic preparedness of all the countries on the planet and we won. You're right. We came out first. We came out first basically because what it was was a, it was a measure of material resources and uh, and um, material and intellectual resources. So it was like you can think of us like this this football team that has managed to attract all the best recruits, but somehow lost is is what it looked like to me. It was just a and and so the question was, what happened? Like why? Um, and then I found myself, and I didn't have to write the book, right? I mean, I don't think if I hadn't found the right people to write the book, I just wouldn't have written the book. I stumbled in, 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 into what was clearly a piece of a book. And it was, the question I was asking is like, all right, what was the plan that we failed to execute? Everybody was talking about we had this plan and we didn't do the plan. And what was the plan? Where did it come plan from? The plan stayed on the shelf. The plan, the plan was in a folder and the plan never came off the shelf. Yeah. All that stuff. And there was this unbelievable story. I mean, an incredible story about how the plan was created. And it was created uh, back in 2005, 2006, when, 2006, when George Bush was handed a copy of John Barry's The Great Influenza. Uh, um, and he read about what had happened in 1918. And Bush at that point was in a state of like, you know, red alert. He'd, he'd gone through, he'd endured 9-11 and he was managing Katrina at that point. And he was sort of thinking like, what's next? Locusts, you know, it's just like how bad, what's the next big, and he read this thing and he turned to someone in the White House and said like, all right, what's the plan if this happens again? And they said, there really isn't a plan. And he freaked. And, and in a matter of a, a couple of weeks, had managed to get Congress to allocate seven billion dollars to to the to the creation of a plan and preparedness for a pandemic. You can trace the like the creation of these mRNA vaccines back to that moment. Back but, to that plan. To that plan, but but it was to the people who came together to create the plan. And in the middle of this the, the, this plan created, they they what they did it was and it was really kind of reassuring. Um, tribute to our ability of our government to actually do something. The White House pulled, asked uh, all relevant agencies in, in the government to send them the most creative thinker they had to, uh, to, to work together on creating a plan. Two of these people were doctors not really public policy people. They had one of them happened to be in the vet Department of Vet Veterans Administration. And then one of them happened to be, I think, at NIH at the, at the time, um, Richard Hatchett and Carter Mesher. And they were really doctors. They weren't like doctors who went to medical school and then went to Washington. They were, they were one was a cancer doctor and one was an ICU doctor. And they spent most of their careers doc as doctors. And they, they tackled the problem, which we all were living with uh, for a year and some, of what do you do before you have a vaccine, before you have drugs? Like, what do you do to defend yourself against a deadly pathogen? And they found, and this is what was so incredible to me about the story, they found that there was a kind of fatalism that, that had taken root in the public health establishment, that 
the lesson that had been drawn from 1918, when lots of town, every city tried stuff, but there was still like death everywhere, that people looked at that and they said, the social interventions, closing churches and saloons and, and schools and all that, um, basically what we call social distancing, didn't work. Um, so once you know that, all you, can, all you can do is rush to get a vaccine. Like if those things don't, wor don't work, uh, you, you know, throw up your hands and, and don't, don't waste your time and don't disrupt your economy to, to try that. But these guys went back into the archives. They read John Barry's book and they saw, hmm, actually, yeah, yeah, there, were, there was death everywhere. Yeah, the people got the flu and died, but actually the death rates were quite different from place to place. And they went back and they analyzed in an academically respectable way and published it in a peer reviewed journal, the differences between cities in, in when they introduced the interventions, like when they said, we're gonna socially distance, we're gonna close the churches, et cetera, in relation to when the virus arrived in the city. And they, they compared St. Louis to Philadelphia in their most famous study. And they showed, look, the, the death rate in Philadelphia was multiples of what it was in St. Louis because St. Louis shut down earlier. So don't and say this doesn't- Philadelphia had a parade, right? Right, right. Don't say this doesn't work. Now you may say you don't like the cost of it. That's a different issue, but don't say it doesn't work. It works. And they managed to then sell the public health establishment, not just in this country, but all over the world on the effectiveness of social interventions. So you can trace back the reflexive um, uh, response in, mo in a lot of societies to the beginning of the, in the beginning of the pandemic, Australia. You call Australia and you ask like, how did you know? How did you control this disease? They said, we just use your playbook created by these doctors. Mm -hmm. So, the, and the, but the, the kind of roll up your sleeves and figure out what to do story is, this is the beginning for me. I thought, oh my God, it, the, 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 as characters, they were great. But the story of like why we're doing this, why we're why social intervention is even taking place, why social distancing is, is goes back to those guys' work. So that was the beginning of ah, maybe there's a book in this. Um, so the way you talk about it though is such optimism, right? It, it's amazing what they did. They did this amazing thing. They all came together. They discovered the answer. They found it. They did it. Raw, you know, go America. And yet we ended up, you know, well behind. Um, because we, did, we were the only ones who didn't eat our own cooking. Uh, you know, that, that it, it, us in Sweden and the United Kingdom and a couple of other places, but that the people who ate our cooking really outperformed us. And um, there, there was this false, I mean, it, we're all aware of the tribalism that is American politics right now. It, it, um, it encouraged this false narrative, which to this day, I think infects the American response to the American idea of what we should be doing. Um, and, and the false narrative is actually you're given a choice. The choice is between your economy and, and, the, and the health of your population. And that if you just let the thing run um, and you didn't close anything down, we'd all been better off. Um, well, What's false, there's a couple of things false about that narrative. One is we're approaching 750,000 dead Americans, 750,000 lives lost. Um, if you just let the thing run, who knows what that number would have been, double. So you're talking about many, many, many hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, but maybe the point is that if you let the thing run, you don't get your economy. Like people aren't, if a million and a half Americans are dying, people aren't getting on airplanes and going to corporate conferences to hear people talk about what's, what the future is going to look like in 50 years. That, that's not what's happening. Yeah, people are going are to hiding restaurant. in their houses. They're, they're yes. hiding. They're, people are sending their kids, and now people are sending their kids to school. So it's just, it's, and in fact, the closest thing there is to like a, a um, what's the phrase? A natural experiment. Um, uh, is in the Nordic countries. Sweden let the thing run. Uh, Norway and Denmark, Denmark used the plan. Um, there've been there's been peer-reviewed papers that showing that not only did Sweden have like twice twice the death rate thanks to this, but their economy suffered even more. 
So that you actually, it's, it's not either or, it's, 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 you need both. That if you, if you, if you're aggressive up front with the social interventions and you contain um, the virus like Australia did, yeah, it is disruptive to your economy, but it is not as disruptive as, disruptive as, as if, as it, as it would be if you let the thing run. And um, COVID is a peculiarly sinister pathogen. I mean, it is, it's a little different in some ways from what they imagined when they built the plan. They didn't imagine a lot of asymptomatic, mm -hmm. asymptomatic spread in particular. But, but the basic idea is, all right, you adapt the plan to the pathogen. Yeah, okay, it's not the flu, it's a little different, so we're gonna have to do a little different things, but you don't throw up your hands and say, we don't do anything. So these people saved, they, they saved, their work saved hundreds of thousands, I don't know, maybe millions of lives. It's an incredible achievement, what they did, pers persuading the world that you should try. Um, so is that the reason for sort of the optimistic, upbeat tone? And there is an optimistic, upbeat, you know. There is. No, we, no. We, we, let, we can put on a show, let's get my father's barn, you know, my, to, to the so, whole thing. But is is it that or is it that you are generally an optimistic, uh, upbeat person? Where Where did this come from? I mean, this is going to sound very strange to say, but I had more fun writing this book. And I had more fun writing this book because the characters gave me hope. Oh my God, uh, the characters. You could and, and not so, have invented so the, those I mean, characters. The, 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 I mean, Carter Mesher was, he, he's a subtle character, but Carter Mesher, this ICU doctor who really, he, 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 his one gift in life is being able to react under pressure in the moment and save people's lives in ICUs. He's got ADD and ADHD and all those other alphabet problems. He gets himself through med school, med school in a very odd way. Uh, but is in a crisis focused. And the way in his life, he takes that focus on a patient who's dying and is somehow able to port it when the VA hospital is, is collapsing because of all kinds of problems. He's brought in to fix the hospital. He treats the hospital as his patient and he figures out how to fix this system. And then he's brought in by the VA to fix a whole system of hospitals. And he starts thinking systematically about like medical error. And then he's brought into the White House and he thinks about the whole society. And, and he's thinking of the society as his patient. Um, the, and the way, I mean, the creativity with which these people went about their job was, it was hopeful. It's like, yeah, we have the talent. We did have the best team. Um, so that's one reason for the tone of it. The other reason is, you know, as I'm writing it, I wasn't thinking exactly like this, but it was kind of true. The three main characters were really kind of three legs of a stool and there would be, and the three aspects of a really good pandemic response. One of the characters is the grand strategist, Carter Mesher. Another character is the on the ground public health official and charity dean. And the third is a guy named Joe DeRisi who's sort of like cutting edge science and detection of pathogens. And I was, in a way, I was, there's a, there's a fantasy parable going on in this book. It's me, it's me creating my own pandemic response team. <laughs> <laughs> it's the guy, it's the people who should I mean, the Avengers, the people who should have been doing this. And you see that, yeah, yeah, you put it in these these people's hands, and you maybe you get a slightly different response. So it's it's the the Moneyball team of the pandemic or something. You know what it is? It's <laughs> funny you bring up this. You know, I, another book because I, I it's not that I pride myself, but I do th I think. I try not to write the same book twice. I, I try to find something that's what energizes me is it's new, you know, it's hard. I don't know how it's gonna go. This was the first time I had a story that reminded me so much of another story in the way it naturally structured itself that I thought, huh, what do these things have in common that I'm not seeing? And why do I feel like I'm slightly repeating myself? And the book was the big short. And it was, and it was here you had two the book, book about the financial crisis. And that story is about these characters on the fringe of the, of the financial system who are seeing systematic um, problems inside that system that the system itself can't perceive. And that they're, they're screaming at the top of their lungs and betting money at the same time about what's wrong in the system and the system won't hear it. And it's a very similar story, th this one, um, 
with a story of kind of main in, mainstream institutional failure, but with with people near enough to those institutions to be able to diagnose what's going on in them, but they aren't in the right seat to do anything about it. Um, so, you know, in the case of the financial crisis, it's it's like Morgan Stanley and Citigroup and Merrill Lynch are, are not only, you know, generating massive amounts of really dumb subprime mortgage loans, they're buying them, them betting on them themselves and they're going to lose tens of billions of dollars. And, you know, their very existence is going to be is going to be threatened. Um, in the case of the uh, in the case of the pandemic, the institution that should have been at the center of the response, the Center for Disease Control, is months behind my characters in seeing what's going on and what needs to be done. And they're, they're, they're yelling at it, you know, you, you need to do this. And I think, um, so the books, if you look at the structure of the books, they, they're, they're, they are similar structures. It, it's, it's three characters coming in from different angles on the problem and shining flashlights on the pro problem while with this insane dark center not understanding the problem. But if you look at like in both cases, and this is what the penny dropped for me, there was this similarity in that the, the problem at the bottom and in the institutions was that incentives had gotten screwed up, that the incentives, that the people in the, who were meant to be dealing either not be making bad subprime loans or actually controlling disease, the institutions had evolved in such a way to incentivize the people in them not to do those jobs um, and or to do them badly or to do them perversely and um, and giving rise to the need for these for these kind of characters to actually explain what's going on. I mean, all I'm doing in a very simple way, and you do this, you know what I'm doing. I'm looking for not just people I can make swing on the page because you can make a lot of people swing on the page. I'm looking for people who can teach me, really teach me, like make me feel, put my mind to rest. Like I now fully understand this because you have successfully explained it to me so that they can teach the reader. And that I, that I can't find that person in the Center for Disease Control or in Citigroup. I have to go to some, you know, unknown hedge fund in the middle of the wilderness or some no, nobody public health officer in the state of California. Th that in itself tells you that, what, that, that there's a problem. Yeah, but that, but I was driven to those characters by the nature of the of the situation. Okay, we have to talk about Charity Dean before yes. before we get any any further. She is the perfect character. Um, there were times where I I you know stared at the page to to say I I know he didn't make it up. But, <laughs> You know, that, that she had a mobile in her childhood bedroom that looked like a virus. Um, it, it, her entire life was spent preparing for this. As you were hearing this stuff, what, what as a writer, what you, was there ever a, this is too good to be true? This is too much? <laughs> it's not believable? But the problem, if, if it were just her telling me the story, um, Although she's a very persuasive character, I think if she just told you her story, there wouldn't be much about it. That you, you you wouldn't think. Oh, I didn't doubt her. I just no, thought no, no reader is going to believe. No, no, you know, no that, I know, no, no. Just... So a couple of a cup, but but there are always these reality checks. You go into the Department of Public Health in Santa Barbara and you interview the nurses, and they tell you all about her, or you talk to her parents or her sister. Uh, so you hear about how what her upbringing was like, and um, so. Everything she never didn't check out. I went, you know, I, I, I the, there, all the things she told me, I, they just, it was just never. There was never that little thing. Oh, someone else has a different story. That that never, that never happened. The moment where I thought, I can't believe this. I mean, I can't believe this. Was all right. She's established herself to me, as she is at the. When I meet her, she's second in command at the California Department of Public Health, which puts her like. She's a nobody. She's six levels down from decision making. And her boss is refusing to let her to use the word pandemic or talk about what's going to happen in the state of California all through January and February and March. Uh, so that she is sti she's stifled, even though in early January, she's alive to the threat and is sort of is able to whiteboard for you out almost a, a, a pretty 
pretty clear prediction of the future if we don't intervene in any way. Um, so she's established, and she's established to me that since childhood, she's been obsessed with infectious disease, with communicable disease. She's gone to unbelievable lengths to get out of a evangelical rural community in Oregon that didn't want her to even get a college education. They just wanted her to marry someone and breed. It was controlled by church elders who, um, who, who had a very limited view of what women should do in the world. She got herself through, I mean, she'd, she'd been, she'd been, <clears throat> she'd had her, she'd suffered a lot to get where she was, had a medical degree, was a surgeon and was a, had a degree in, in um, public health. So she had spent, and she'd spent the bulk of her career as the, the public health officer for Santa Barbara County. So had managed lots of disease outbreaks on the ground. And the, and it, the drama of that was incredible. So she's established, she's obsessed with this subject for me. Um, she also has established that even though she's very data science oriented, that she's got this mystical intuitive streak. Like she sometimes, she's the kind of person who thinks sometimes she knows something, but doesn't know why she knows it. So she is- Hence the title of the book, yes. Yes, and and she she's the kind of person who will walk into a- uh, immigrant refugee shelter and think she can smell a disease and that you can and tell you that you can actually smell disease. All right. She'd also told me in the course of our first interviews that every year on her birthday, December the 21st, she sat down and she made a list of resolutions and, um, and had done it, um, ever since she, she had, I think she'd done ever since she'd gotten sober. She'd been an alcohol, she was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And that she had mentioned that off the cuff, she wrote them down on the back. She kept a record of them on the back of a portrait of her, of her grandmother who she'd, who she'd loved and that hung on a wall somewhere in her house. So like she told me that some weeks earlier. And at some point I said to her, she, her house was strange that when I went to go visit her, her house, was decorated in like one way or another signs to herself, reminders of herself of who she was, inspirational quotes. They're like post-it notes on the bathroom mirror, that kind of stuff. So I said, you know, it would really help me in getting to know you. If I can just, if you just leave me alone in your house for an hour, let me go wander around and look at everything. I, and give that's me a, not weird or anything. But at that point, I had persuaded her that she was either going to have to trust me or not trust me. And I, if I was going to do write this as I thought I could write it, I really needed to get to know her. And so she was kind of like, she, it was like wandering around my house. Yeah, a little weird. But finally she said, okay. And she went out back, back to the swimming pool with her kids. And I wandered around the house. And I get to the grandmother's portrait. And the grandmother's portrait hung, hangs beside her bed in her bedroom. And I think I've given, she's given me license to just look at what I want to look at. I pull the portrait off the wall, put it on the bed and start to read all the resolutions going back to like 2005. Neat, very neat handwriting. There are like, you know, eight items on every, at, at every year. And all of them are the kind of things you or I might make as New Year's resolutions. It's like, I don't know, learn French or lose 10 pounds or stay sober or whatever. That was always number one, stay sober. Until you get to 2019. In 2019, the item number one is stay sober. So this is December 21, 2019. Item number two is it has started. There is nothing like that on the back of this thing. There are hundreds of these resolutions and they're all like lose 10 pounds. And I said, it has started. Like nobody knew anything had started in December of 2019. I mean, it's, uh, there's some reports in January of 2019. <laughs> So I went, I called her into the house and I said, like, what is this? And she said, I didn't know. She said, I had this dream of this like tidal wave coming over the country and I didn't know what it was. And I just felt it in my bones. I felt something was happening or about to happen. So I just wrote that down. Uh, and that's, I got chills. I mean, that, that was, so um, she, this kind of instinct 
is not an instinct. That, it's an instinct that gives me the willies. Like I like to know why I know what I know. Right. And I and tend to be- in a book be, about science in particular. In a book about science right. in particular. The whole of my book, Moneyball, is an argument against intuition. <laughs> it's, you know, it is a funny kind of thing, but I could not deny this was the reality of this woman's life. Um, and uh, so that was the moment I, I did think like this is, if it wasn't true, you couldn't make it up because no one would believe it. Uh, and, but, but, but I will say that, you know, I've gotten to know her very well. She does have very good instincts and intuitions. Sometimes they're wrong, but, but, it, but the, maybe the bigger point is that is why she had come to cultivate that side of herself and not just the science side. And I think it was because of the job of controlling disease that when you're controlling disease, by the time, if you wait until you have all the science, you're done, you lose. That, that if you, by the time you know that COVID is like killing people in the United States and it's really dangerous, it, 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 it's too late to do much about it. That you, you need to, that you're, you're dealing with this invisible threat that's multiplying exponentially. And the first things you actually see, sickness, that, then death, are such lagging indicators that if you aren't operating at the level of I sense something is wrong and I'm going to act on that with partial data, um, you don't have any hope. And I'll give you one example. Um, when she was the health officer at Santa Barbara County, she was constantly in conflict with the Center for Disease Control. All the characters, I wasn't looking for this, mm -hmm. all the characters, no matter what they're doing, are constantly in conflict before the Trump administration with the Center for Disease Control. They're finding that it's a slow, unimaginative, highly academic institution that is very uncomfortable when anything controversial comes up. And every disease outbreak is ends up being controversial. If you close a school because there's a measles outbreak, some parents are furious. If you uh, insist on vaccinating people, some people get pissed off. If um, Clearly, yes. Yes. And so, so um, I can't remember the year. Uh, say it's 2016, um, there was a, a, a student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, turns up in the emergency room at Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara, and his legs are purple. Um, the test for, the doctor looks at it, the doctor who happened to be Charity Dean's former mentor and professor, looks at it and says, this is, me it's, it's meningococcal. I think meningitis, I think it is. is what they, but um, and, um, and it's contagious, and they, but they test the kid and it comes back, it doesn't come back saying, it, it, does, it comes back indicating it isn't. So it takes about 24 hours before they actually get confirmation of what it is. And the clock for Charity Dean at that moment is ticking that the, the thing, this, the way this- is an this, entire campus. There's an entire campus, it gets, it, it gets swapped, I think, through fluids, I think like saliva. So if kids are making out in fraternities, uh, this kid was a fraternity kid. He was an athlete. He was in dorms. You know, he had a do three dorm, uh, three uh, uh, roommates in a dorm. Um, and, the, you know, they're going to have to, they end up having to amputate the, his legs, uh, the 19 year old boy. Um, and Charity Dean gets on the phone with the CDC and says, we need to do this and this and this and this. CDC and the health officers at the at the university. We need to close the fraternities. We need to um, distance the kids, get some hotel rooms so they're not all jammed together. And we need to, um, there is a actually a vaccine that's been approved in Europe that the FDA is still not approved, but I think it, it's, it, we should it, we should administer the vaccine in the, in the most likely places this is. So, uh, the CDC refuses to sign off on any of it. Not only that, they say that um, everything you do is, is speculative, and uh, if anything goes wrong, you're going to basically you're going to lose your job. And they're, they're shouting matches about it. UCSB, which is sitting there thinking, "Oh my God, we're going to have this deadly outbreak on the campus," ends up listening to Charity Dean. Um, and that time she, she was right. Well, that it's actually what happened. The next step. The CDC, once they see that they're, they're not going to prevent this from happening, prevent her from doing her things, they come back and they say, we have a proposal. 
let's do the things you want to do, but let's do them one at a time and see it, what has an effect so that it's a kind of science experiment. And she says, science experiment, kids are going to lose their legs. Uh, and she ignores them. Again, getting shouted out by the CDC. Sure enough, there is no outbreak. She doesn't, this, it's no science experiment. She doesn't know what worked. Presumably something worked here. The, but the punchline is a couple of years later, there's another outbreak, similar outbreak, I think at the University of Oregon. Can't remember, but it was a big state school. And the CDC tells the health officers at the university to call Charity Dean to figure out what to do because she... <laughs> she knows everything, she knows. yes. Because she knows now everything she did was controversial. Uh, and, um, and, and everything that she did was partly out of intuition. She didn't know if there was going to be a massive outbreak of meningitis. She was just taking the precautions. And, um, and there are a lot of parents. I, if I were a parent of one of those children on that campus, I'd have been very grateful that she had the nerve to do it. But she put a career at risk over and over. And as she said, being the the health officer, a local health officer, and actually, as we've seen is true, if you're going to do it right, it means you, you've got to be willing to lose your job every day. Because okay, so you so you paint a picture of of a country full of charity deans, you know, amazing people who know things and are on the front lines. And there's also, I think there's a line in the book, something like one day historians will look back on the people who called themselves Americans and wonder how they ever got anything done. How they ever because, called themselves. Yeah, because our, our institutions, you, you portray them as, as beyond repair. Is that going too far? I don't think they're beyond repair. Um, and I don't think that they're just our institutions. I think they're an expression of our society. I don't think, I, I don't think you can just like blame the CDC. Because we enable, we, we, we created the CDC, we're a democracy, that we allowed that to happen. There's some simple things you could do, I think, that instantly would make it better. And there's been a simple drift in the, in the federal government, in, in, in the, especially in these risk management functions that has been, that makes the world much more dangerous for all of us. And the simple drift is that they've become more politicized. And what I mean by that is not just, yes, they're, you know, like all of us swept up in this maelstrom of tribal warfare. Y yes, that's true. Um, but in their actual structure, they become more politicized. So there is, there's a, there's a history to this, but there's a history to uh, this in a lot of different places in the federal government. There was a time, the period in which the CDC gained its reputation as the leading health organization in the world, like the, the gold standard, was a period where the CDC director was not a presidential appointee. He was not a political appointee. He was a career civil servant. And there's an important distinction. It's the distinction between Robert Redfield, the current, the then former CDC director, and Anthony Fauci, who is a career civil servant. Trump could rail about Fauci, but he couldn't fire him. He, could, he couldn't fire him because Fauci had protections. I mean, he, they were, they were, they would have, there'd have been a review board that would have determine whether Fauci was actually derelict in his duties, he, he, that, he, that he, had, he wasn't on the same political short leash that Redfield was. Redfield was a presidential appointee. We turned the job of running the CDC into a presidential appointed position. And what does that do? It, it, it has all these knock-on effects. One is, for that job, you're now picking someone out of um, a pool of more or less ideological soulmates. Uh, I mean, you're, that you're not picking out of the pool of all people for just the most talented person. You're filtering for some sort of political identity. So that's one thing. So you're, you're not going to get the most talented person, um, except by luck. Uh, two is the, the person who's in the job can be fired at the whim of the president and is sitting there. And so the White House is on their shoulders and just in a, over their shoulders in just a completely different way. But three, and this is maybe the worst part of it. Um, the average tenure now in, in Washington of political, politically appointed Senate confirmed people, these people who are in those jobs, is 18 months. How on earth can you run an organization well if everybody in it knows you're gone in 18 months? If it takes you know, a year to get confirmed and you're, you know, all that stuff. And then that it creates such, you, who could run a corporation if 
what corporation could survive if you, everybody knew the CEO was going to change every 18 months? It just, it's just, it's a bad structure. And, I, and so there's a structural fix that would even, you know, it, it, would, it, take, it would require the Senate to make a big, one big leap. But um, where you say, you could even say, okay, keep it a presidentially appointed position in the beginning, but it's a 10 year position. Uh, I'm still what, stuck on the idea of the Senate making a big leap <laughs> of any sort right now. So, well, you, know. you know, it's funny. If I would tell you something that's, this is a, it was telling. I, I think this is a mu as much a matter of understanding as it is a matter of political ideology. Jennifer Granholm is now the Secretary of Energy. And she, six months ago, five, four months ago, five months ago, um, went to the Senate to propose that the person who's in charge of cybersecurity in the Department of Energy, who's sort of protecting the grid from cyber attacks. So it's a terrifying threat. I mean, you think, oh, what, what would be the, it wouldn't be that big a deal if lights went out for a, a month. Actually, it would be death and destruction. Um, that job, that job used to be a, a career position. It got converted like the CDC job into a presidentially Senate confirmed job, which means that nobody's in it for very long and who would want it anyway. She went to go seed kind of authority and say, I, this, I don't want to, we shouldn't, Biden shouldn't appoint this person. This should be a career position. So she's, it, that's movement. She tried to do this. Angus King, in, great guy, independent senator from Maine, nixed the idea. I mean, it's still afloat. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? But he had an initially hostile reaction but because he thought, what he thought was, if we make it not Senate confirmed, if we make it just a career job, we're saying it's not important. And that's, 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 right, that's right. just wrong. It's just like a and misunderstanding. That is the way of thinking on, in political circles. So why do you write books? I mean, is, is it to get the things we're talking about to change? Is it to entertain people? Is it because you really like writing? I mean, what, why, what is the purpose of books in general and your books in particular? Well, I'm gonna ask you that question too after I give you an answer. Um, if I were to write Orwell's version of why I write, um, he wrote a wonderful essay called why I write. Um, I would start with just the pleasure it gives me to do it. Um, I never feel more myself or more whole than when I'm in the middle of a story I've fallen in love with, uh, and, and putting it down on paper. So that's number one. Um, it, if I didn't get paid to do it, I don't know if I would do it. So I think that clearly money has something to do with it. I mean, I can make a living doing it. So just the necessity of putting food on the table is probably part of the reason. The most complicated part of it is um, what, uh, what effects I hope to achieve, what I hope this causes. Because I learned quite early in my career that what the book I thought I wrote and the effects I thought it might have it would end up being very different from the book people read and the, and the effects would be very different from what I imagined. Yeah. I didn't, I, I lost faith that I could control that. I almost, I almost think this, the more I try to control the effects of the book I write, the less good the book's going to be. That my job is to, is to lay out a story that educates, entertains tr at best, maybe even transports the reader and let the reader make of it what they will. In fact, leave room in the, re in the, in the, in the story for the reader to walk in and, and make their own sense of it. So what I'm not as a polemicist, I, I don't think you take the reader or the society by the throat and you change their mind uh, uh, or make them think a certain way. So, so I, don't, I don't think, I think it's for other people to take it and use it to have an effect. Why do you write? You do it too. The short answer is because it, it's the one thing I'm good at that I can find someone to pay me for. <laughs> um, it was kind of gravitational pull. Um, I just kept finding myself doing it, uh, you know, started back where we met, but back yeah. at, at Princeton, right? So I just sort of found myself doing the extracurriculars that involved writing and then taking the classes that involved writing. And so 
then I had experience to apply for jobs that involved writing and journalism. And, you know, the next logical step was to write a book. Then I discovered that the long form is something I feel I was built to do. Right. Um, but it, it, it all really evolved. Um, and what do I want the effects to be? I do hope that people think about things that they might not have thought about if I hadn't written them down. Um, that's, you know, I, I'm not looking for the world to change necessarily, but just for people to get glimpses of parts of it they might not otherwise have seen. Yeah. So it's, it's simple and very complicated at the same time. Yeah. You did not start as, you know, you, you, unlike charity, Dean, you did not know you wanted to be this for your entire well, life. Well, we were in right? the same we were in the same class at Princeton, and you were probably publishing pieces in the New York Times while you were there. Uh, uh, maybe the Daily Princetonian. The yeah, Daily but... Princetonian. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't have any sense of what I wanted to do until I got to the end of my senior year, and I was so consumed by the writing of my senior thesis that I thought I want to keep doing this. And I, I misinterpreted that signal at first. I thought that meant I wanted to be an art historian. Um, and uh, my thesis advisor said, there's no point. They're, no gonna, they're not gonna be any art historians. It's a dying field, basically, don't do that. So that left me you know, at loose ends. And I, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's writing. I, maybe it's, that's what I wanna do. So I, I found my way into it in a really messy way. I mean, I didn't have I didn't have any connections. I didn't know anybody who did it, who wrote. Um, you didn't take John McPhee's class. I didn't take John McPhee. It wouldn't have occurred to me that John McPhee would ever let me into his class. I love, I, you know, having said that, I had read everything McPhee had ever written. Um, and are now well, compared to him regularly. It's funny. I, I mean, I read those books before I got to Princeton. Uh, not all of them, but I read Coming Into the Country and A Sense of Where You Are and uh, and, and and the rest of them I read, read while I was at Princeton. So I, I, I was attracted to that kind of writing. Um, but no, I didn't think I could hang in John McPhee's class. It wouldn't have even occurred to me. I didn't have any sense of myself as a writer. I just didn't. Uh, and so it wasn't until I started submitting magazine articles randomly to magazines that I started to get a sense that, huh, m maybe I can do this. Uh, and it, it was messy. I, it wasn't a it wasn't a carefully thought out career plan. And I, it was and it wasn't really sponsored by institutions. Right. I mean, I did spend a couple of years at the New Republic and I spent. You know, I've had I've had deals at the New York Times magazine and at Vanity Fair. And but I've always been basically a free agent. And you keep using the word writer rather than journalist. You don't think of yourself as a journalist. I I, I am a journalist. I mean, yeah, but I, I guess because but I don't. But that's not how you describe yourself. Well, because I've never written for newspapers, you know? And so it's, I've never done that. Um, so I, no, I, I never thought of, and when I, in the very beginning, when I was fiddling around at age 22 with what kind of writer am, am I? I had ambitions to write stage plays, film scripts, um, I fiddle with a novel. I didn't really like that, but the film scripts and stage plays I did like. Um, so I didn't have I didn't have a sense of I'm a, I, I belong in a newspaper. And when I think journalists, I think that. But I, I mean, I'm a nonfiction writer is what I think. What I think. Um, but as you you I mean, you kind of came up through the newspaper world. I did. Um, to my surprise, and I will tell you that sitting in John McPhee's class, I did not think I belonged there. Um, there were some people who did. I wasn't one of them. I kept wondering why he admitted me i've asked him he doesn't remember but <laughs> well you know my impression tell me if i'm wrong i know our our cohort at princeton our, that are generated a lot of very very good writers todd purdom david remnick was just a couple of years ahead of us i mean they, they, they're here yep david duchovny mm -hmm. finding his finding finally finding his calling as a, yeah, as yeah. a but, but we, we 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 don't shut up our our group and well, but, but I was going to say, on, my impression, I up, had a, on. my impression at the time, and it was just select, it was just who I happened to know. The people I knew who had got, who were in McPhee's class kind of smoked Galois and wrote, wore black turtlenecks in the back of the students, student center. And I thought they kind of seemed phony. <laughs> Interesting, because I think of them as like all the, the nerds who had not, you know, who whose idol were 
Woodward and Bernstein. I mean, that was my first oh, uh, political awareness yeah. was Watergate. And yeah. so, and the journalists were the good guys. Right. And frankly, I had never heard of investment banking and I'm pretty sure most of the people in there hadn't. Right. So the career choice was doctor, lawyer, or well, the journalists are the good guys. Right. You had heard of banking when the rest of us hadn't. And so you kind of went there. I heard it. I heard about it just the way the rest of us heard about it. When when I went to the career services office at Princeton, they said, you know, Lehman Brothers is coming through. What's Lehman Brothers? And you started to see, you remember, you'd still see people who you thought were ordinary, ordinary college students turning up on campus in a suit and uh, and going, and what are they doing? So that it it crept into my life that way. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what an investment banker was either. Um, I I stumbled into that job after graduate school and that job gave me my first great material, you know, gave me liar's poker, yep. which by the way, this is a very odd thing. Um, there was never a proper audio book made of liar's poker. I did an abridged version, but it was 1989 and what they did was cassettes on, you know, it was just like, there was no market. Uh, I just got the rights back and I just reread, I read it for, for the audio book for the first time since 1989. And it's really interesting going back and looking at your earlier self on the page. I just never done it before. And I was raw. I mean, my God, you can see the writer learning how to write by writing his book. Chapter eight is better than chapter two. Uh, it's um, it, so I, I was just, I was figuring, I was kind of groping and figuring it out. So is it that you were raw then or is it that you were younger then? I mean, when I look at the trajectory of your books and you know, we are both the same year in school, which means we both turned 60 during the pandemic. Although I think it doesn't count, right? Because I feel like I never had my 60th birthday and therefore I simply am frozen in time. But anyway, I, I see Liar's Poker for you as you identified with the kids. You, you were one of them. Um, and now you're writing about emeritus Greece, you know, people who are, have been at this forever and no one's been listening to them. And if you sort of track the ages, I didn't, but I'm betting that the people in um, the premonition are much closer or are very close to your age. So they're the liars, pokers, people grown up. Um, you know, it, it has your view of who the protagonist is, where the story is changed? I don't think by age. Um, I, and I'd say that in, with some confidence because I'm a, I think I'm about to write a book about a 28 year old. Uh, so okay it, then. So, no, what, what I really noticed when I was reading the old book was just the level of incompetence. I mean, this is at the level of the sentence and the, the storytelling decisions you see the decisions, right? I mean, writing is just a bunch of decisions. And I see the way I'm, I just made a bunch of suboptimal decisions with really great material. Um, I mean, they weren't all bad. Some of it I quite liked, but it was just, some of it was just like, I would never do it that way now. I know, I know better. Um, and, uh, and so I, I don't, uh, Charity Dean is what, 44 years old. So she's, She's younger than all the my bosses at Solomon Brothers were, who were characters in the book. So I don't think I don't think age is. I'm not drifting into writing about older people necessarily. Um, I just I, but there's a, but I just I mean like you must feel this way. I you know I've just gotten better at what I do. Uh, you know it's just you do it and you get better at it. Uh, there'll be some time where I'll look up and say I can't do it as well anymore. But I haven't, I haven't felt that way. I, I felt in writing the premonition. I felt. I felt in peak form. And then I felt, I felt I can't get material as good as this. Uh, I, I've had, it's as good as the material ever gets. And I'm as good, I'm as, I'm as strong as a writer as I've ever been. And it felt that way. It flowed in a way that, you know, if you would, that you have that experience just a few times in a, in a, in a career. Uh, it was ap absolutely. And joyous. you did it during you did it during a pandemic um, so that, that I, I, was trying, I was looking for the the you know where were the restrictions who how how did you talk to all these people why how were you allowed in were you masked were you shielded did so, that affect your interviews so there were two things uh one is it was it looks like it's it, a premature exercise because it's going on now but i realized pretty early that the book ended when the characters realized it was over, which is June of last year, realized that we lost. 
we lost. We didn't do what we needed to do. So there, and they lost interest. It's like, we can't do it. You know, the society did not do what it was supposed to do. Um, so I knew I had an end point um, and, and everything after that didn't matter to my story. Um, I also knew I had captive characters. They were all trapped in their houses. It was, they were so accessible. Normally the problem I have with characters is they're busy doing something else. And so I could go just get goo balls of time. And in the, they were just, you know, the mask came off uh, and that, or we were, di we were distanced. Um, but we were, it was, you know, outside, you know, 10 feet apart, but it was not. And with charity, the mask came off and she just gave me a tour of her life. I mean, we went through, we went all over Santa Barbara County together. Um, so no, I didn't feel constrained in any way. It was a pain to and go you didn't down. Feel, you didn't feel concerned in any way. No. For your own safety. No. I don't know. I, I, maybe I should have, but I, I didn't. I mean, I, uh, no, I'm not on a high risk group to start with. And this was all I was doing. I mean, I, they, it's not like. It's not like charity was going, and it's not like charity was going from seeing me to going some to some rave. I mean, she was just trapped in her house. So they were these were doctors. So I was I was visiting the doctor. I, you, I think when you're visiting the doctor, you assume you're safe. Uh, that all my characters were doctors. So I, it was just like I, I, these people are not going to infect me. But I, but it was I was so much more interested in the story story than I was in like whether I got COVID. I, I wasn't thinking about it. I just didn't think about it. And you also weren't thinking, I mean, it, it, it does not seem infected by sort of the grief and fear of the time. These were people who were looking at it as a problem to be solved Until rather than allowing themselves. Until the end. To, yes. The book ends so, in a grave. The book, the, I, when I laid it out, um, I, I knew the book ended in a graveyard. I knew that this was about death. Um, it ended with Charity Dean alone in a graveyard. And I knew that's where we were headed. What I didn't know, and what did happen, is um, that the other main, Carter Mesher, who designed the plan to save us from a pathogen, watched his parents haul to the hospital with COVID and watch his mother die. Uh, and I, I didn't know that that loss was going to occur uh, and he would al allow me to write about it. Uh, so I didn't, so it, it, in the end, it, it's, it is driving to a place of loss but until the loss happens, it is not a story of loss. It's a story of these people trying to prevent loss. P people who have a very deep sense of what that loss is because they've been surrounded by it their whole careers. You know, Carter Mesher is, is poetic on the subject of the value of life. Um, and, and it's because he's watched people lose it and he watched the hole it leaves in the lives of the people who love them. And he's, he's seen it over and over and over. And so when he thinks of 750,000 people died of COVID and half of them probably shouldn't have, if we done it, you know, if we manage this at all, well, it would be, you know, a fifth, the death rate, whatever it is. He doesn't think of it as a statistic. He's thinking of, in, he can see, he can almost see the individual faces and see the grief in the families. So um, uh, it, it was always driving to that place, but it was always, but until it got to that place, it was in a, the, the place the story is in is how do we stop it? You know, how do we stop that from happening? Um, as most people on who are watching this know, they originally had tickets to come hear you talk in June um, and we canceled because your daughter Dixie died um, in, in an accident. Talk about grief in the middle of of grief. Would you have written about Carter Escher the same way you think? I mean, what, what's, what's that done? I wonder about that. I, I can, um, Dixie Lee Lewis uh, was killed in the car accident in May and she was with her boyfriend and they um, crossed a double yellow line and went head on into a truck. And um, she was 19 years old and a, a softball player at Pomona College. And we loved her as much as a as parents can love a child and it's been just absolutely devastating but um it, it's it's you know this is part of life you know it, it, that you learn i have managed to evade major loss up until now my parents are still alive and thriving and living in the house i grew up in um 
I've lost a couple of close friends, but it's something a little different about that, especially when they're in their 50s. Um, this is of a different order. And it, it's admitted me as a uh, to a kind of citizenship in the kingdom of grief. Um, and I found people come out of the woodwork, people who I was quite close to and who kept stories to themselves to tell me their own stories of loss. And um, it's a part of, it's a part of life loss. I've now, I now know what it feels like. And I wonder, I wonder how I might've written about Carter's mother differently. I was just, I was doing it through Carter, but not feeling so much what he felt. Now I know exactly what, I know what he felt. Um, and what it's like is it, it's, um, it's an undescribed, it's an often described country that is still poorly understood. I, I don't think anybody actually can tell you how to deal with grief. I think that it's a very personal thing. And my particular grief is a very personal thing. And it's not quite like anybody else's grief. Um, uh, but it's, it's, um, it's an education, you know, uh, I'm, I've been, I've been amazed, for example, at how exhausting it is like how that for the last five months, every night I go to bed, I'm thinking about Dixie Lewis. And every morning I wake up, I'm thinking about Dixie Lewis. And during the day I'm getting through the day and I'm doing work and all that, but um, with not quite the bounce in my step I normally have. And I, and, and I, it took me a while to figure out what might be going on. And I think what's going on is I had this imagined reality, uh, what my life was going to look like going out. And my mind needs to rewrite that reality now. And it's, it's a tiring thing to do it, but that's what's going on. Um, I, I can't control that she died. And uh, I can't do anything about that. All I can control is what her death causes. And, and I'm determined that it caused good things not bad things. So that's kind of what I'm focused on is what does this cause? Like make sure that it doesn't cause more pain. See if it causes something else. And I'm sort of thinking about what that might be, but it does put me, plug me right into what I think is one of the moods of the country right now. And I think that we are a country that is disoriented by loss. 750,000 people have died of this thing. The life expectancy in the United States for the first time since 19, to the, since the World War I had declined for three straight years leading into the pandemic. I mean, we're not taking care of each other. The society is not taking care of its people. And eventually we're gonna have to figure out what that means and how to address that. Because on a very personal level, the price is high uh, for, for not. So probably we'll see strains of this in some of your work. Absolutely. Forward. I just don't know quite what it's going to look like yet. Yeah. Well, I'll be reading, Michael. Uh, and um, and I'm sorry it had to be so hard won, but you are a, a good voice for people. Well, I hope so. So it was it was good seeing you. And we have taken far more time than we said we were going to. That's all right. It's been fun talking <laughs> to you. But it's a myself. great chance to talk to you. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that was something. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Michael, for the conversation, insight, and honesty. Before we go, I'd like to let you know about what else StoryFest 2021 has in store. Friday evening, you're invited to raise a glass and celebrate the launch of Mallory O'Meara's much-anticipated book, Girly Drinks, which is a world history of women and alcohol. The event will be virtual, and Sono 1420 will provide a recipe and demonstration for a signature drink from Mallory's book. Saturday morning at 10 a.m., young readers will pink or treat with Victoria Kahn. What better way to start your spooky holiday than with a Pinkalicious Halloween parade? Victoria will read from Pink or Treat. We'll have fun giveaways and kids will be encouraged to come in costume and join the parade. And then at 1 p.m., we present a virtual panel of all-star contributors to the best-selling anthology based on the brilliance of Shirley Jackson, When Things Get Dark moderated by legendary horror editor Ellen Datlow. Please join us on All Hallows Eve this Saturday night for an in-person evening of tricks and terrifying tales 
by best-selling authors Stephen Graham Jones and Grady Hendrix, two of horror fiction's biggest stars. The Storyfest finale will be on November 2nd, starring Mitch Album, who makes the Westport Library his first stop on his latest book tour for The Stranger in the Lifeboat. All of the registration information is up on westportlibrary.org, so please do check it out. And thank you again for being here with us at the kickoff of StoryFest 21, and we hope to see you this weekend. Good night, everyone.